Hi, everyone. Warmly welcome to our Tech Seminar 2022 edition. First of all, big thanks to all our sponsors that makes this event possible. So this year at the Artex Seminar, we'll talk about different ways to create interactive experiences. We have, for example, Rieto talking about his Porras uh, Turvat uh, creation some 20 years back. We have Tyler talking about um, utilizing AI art tools in uh, game concepting. We have AAA Studio uh, rendering. We have uh, High Pipe Tool guys showcasing their, their ways of creating games on, on the stage. So a lot of cool stuff today and tomorrow. But we'll start with Marco Reunanen. Uh, a, he, he will be talking about Alive Dead Media, how to create content for retro computers. Stage is yours, Marco. Thank you, Sonia. Hello, everyone. I'm Marco. Uh, in my daily job, a teacher at Aalto University. And then in my spare time, I'm involved with a few demo groups, Fit, Leave a Story, and Decadence, provided they haven't kicked me out yet, <laughs> but not that I know of. So the topic for my speech today is Alive Dead Media, a course where I taught with um, supporting teachers, I taught retro computing. And why would we do this? How would we do this? Um, maybe some takeaways, like what, what did we learn out of all of this? So first, the purpose. And then uh, the course ran for a few years. So then um, I'll present those years, like what we did each year, and some uh, outcomes, student works, uh, the tools we used, the machines we made content for and then some concluding thoughts. And uh, the format of the course was a one-week intensive workshop, meaning from Monday to Friday, every day, each day, for a full week. So this we call intensive courses. And um, it was part of the Department of Media Teaching, where we uh, teach new media, among other subjects, and it was part of that. And the course was open all the wide, so everybody in the university could take it if they wanted. Mostly we got the art students, but also some um, technology students came there at times. And we ran the course four times and uh, changed the topic every year. So it wasn't the, the same content for every year. So you could take it multiple times and learn about new things every time. And um, sad to say, uh, this spring was the last run of the course. Now the course is no more because of all sorts of uh, organizational changes. They joined two uh, departments, they joined programs. We had to cut back on the amount of courses. But let's focus on the positive and not these sad things that we've been dealing with for <laughs> half a year already. So let's stay on the, on the positive. And why would you want to have a course like this? What is the purpose of teaching old computers to new media students? And uh, the, the nagging thought I had when creating this course was that um, if you say studying painting, you surely know the classic painters and styles and like the big names, like, like the, the artist, artist gurus. And uh, in new media, there's much less of this sort of historical awareness that the stuff we do is part of a larger, like longer continuum. And uh, that also, I'd say, when you know that stuff, it creates you some professional pride. OK, we are standing on the shoulders of giants, and now we know who the giants are. So it, it, it puts things into perspective. This is something that often doesn't necessarily happen in the field of new media compared to other other, say, art programs we have. And uh, as a nice little bonus, these days retro is so cool, everything is like pixel art and, and uh, retro music styles and all that. Um, when you take this course, you would also get a glimpse of how it was back in the day and why the retro styles that we have today, why they are as they are. Then it was supposed to be also a fun week for the students. Like, they could 
draw things, they could compose things, they could program things. Um, you don't always, in university studies, have this sort of possibility for artistic experimentation, doing stuff freely, uh, experimenting. So, yeah, that was one of the purposes, to make it interesting and hands-on for the students. And first and foremost, I like the topic. If I didn't, probably there wouldn't, be, wouldn't have been a course like this. And this is a very good starting point for a course anywhere, that the teacher knows the subject and likes the subject. At times, uh, in this profession, you need to teach subjects that you don't know or don't like, but here I both know and I like the subject. So that's a very good starting point for a course, that you actually have some like, personal passion for the, for the topic and not just doing it for, for the sake of earning your salary. So, we had four runs starting 2019. We started with text and pixel graphics, and then we also ended with text and pixel graphics. So, the circle sort of closed in 2022. And uh, I didn't do this alone. I had big help from visiting teachers Tero Heikkinen, Dr. Terrors, and Derek Holzer when it came to uh, pixel graphics and retro graphics. And then, I'm not a musician, but uh, Miranda Kastema and Yrjö Utsi Fager helped me with that, so I, I uh, owe a lot to them. I couldn't have done this on my own. And uh, then there was, um, the second year was chip and tracker, tracker music, so old sound chips creating uh, music for them, and also like looking into trackers, how trackers are like, how is it to comp compose music with trackers. And then uh, the third theme we had was demo effect coding. So, how to do classic demo effects? Well, you will see what we did later, but uh, that was the third topic we had. And then back to the beginning uh, and wrapping up the course this spring, again with Tero and Derek. And I'll skip the first year because we had the same topic and it was still a very small course that people didn't find it yet, they didn't know about the course. So, I will only show the pixel graphic um, output from the last run of the course. So we'll jump directly to chip and tracker music, which was in 2020, with Yrjö Fager and Miranda Kastemma. And um, uh, of course, we have to start with some sort of history part. Okay, this is the history of sound chips. This is the history of like uh, home computer uh, music and and and. Uh, home computing in general, like what is, what is the background for all of this? And also not just computers, but also a bit um, of, of uh, game consoles, which are very influential as well. And uh, then the, you, the format was usually like this, some sort of introduction in the morning and then experimenting, doing stuff on your own in the afternoon after the lunch. And uh, the first day we started with MSX Basic, uh, using an emulator. Web MSX, and uh, it has this uh, MSX Basics has this music markup language MML, which lets you, uh, in basic, create music for the MSX. And on Tuesday, it was uh, going to tracker music with Uri Fager using Milky Tracker, and then Wednesday uh, with Miranda Kastema Game Boy using uh, Little Sound DJ. This was quite a stretch to many students, I have to say. We, of course, didn't have a Game Boy for everybody, so we used emulators for the Game Boy part of the course. Uh, first of all, like, not many of them had composed anything to these old sound chips, and then using this like, Game Boy interface for doing your composing, but it was quite a stretch. But interesting, and um, some of them managed to make actually interesting tunes. And some of them, at least, um, well, probably swore that they never want to try this again. <laughs> it was the Game Boy part was a bit bit tricky, but uh, nevertheless, an interesting look into how you can also make music compared to maybe the more common today tools that you would use for sound production. And then on Friday we had the final concert. So uh, we started with the MSX. Uh, the PSG of MSX has three sound channels uh, that can play back square waves different pitches and different volumes, and then you, have, uh, you can have noise for percussions, and then you have a shared envelope that is shared between the, all the channels. Uh, pretty typical sound chip for a computer of this time, probably the most co common sound chip for, for home computers of the time. A simple one, but uh, if you're good at it, you can still get something interesting out of it. And this is how they composed. 
So you would make a basic program in this web MSX emulator. You would put the line numbers there, good old basic. And you would use these play commands for playing back notes. You can see there E4, D4, C4, R4. This is the music markup language of MSX Basic that lets you make even, actually, even multi channel music. So I'm making here, um, I think this is a little piece by me. I cannot play back it now, but it has even this like, little echo using three channels. Like one, one channel is playing the main tune, and then the two uh, channels are reserved for this like, slight uh, trashy echo, which sounds a bit like, larger than the MSX would otherwise. But yeah, you can use all the three channels even, uh, even in this like, uh, basic program. So that's pretty good for 80s computers. But yeah, we didn't have, we did bring an MSX there, but uh, mostly the students would use this emulator for trying out stuff. Uh, yeah, one thing I didn't say, uh, we were mostly using like today's tools, emulators and uh, cross-development tools, but uh, also we did, when we were in class, then we did bring the real computers there and we would like play back stuff on them, like we, when they did say pictures, we would show them on a real old CRT display and a real computer to see that, yes, this would have worked in the 80s if <laughs> you did something like this, to give this sort of like feel of realness into it. So. Um, yeah, it's, like, it's a different thing seeing something on the emulator screen on your own computer and something running on that 83 computer there. Wow, this is made by me and this could have been done in the 80s. It gives you quite a different feel to it. Then um, Milky Tracker. Well, this is um, one of the most popular trackers in the vein of old uh, Amiga trackers like Pro Tracker, Sound Tracker, Noise Tracker. Um, those like Amiga Classic trackers. And then if you've used on the PC Fast Tracker 2, this is very much like that as well. So we're very like, how would you say, a school book tracker. And uh, if you're not familiar with trackers, I'll just quickly explain. These are the tracks, these vertical tracks here. One, two, three, four. So these are sound channels. And then you place samples on them. And those are the instruments you use. You can put their drums and whatever you can like sample with a mic or, or otherwise. Uh, you can play back from uh, each of these channels. And then you can play them back at different pitches and, and use all sorts of effects. And that's how you make music with a tracker. Then uh, that Nintendo Game Boy part, which was a bit more involved. Uh, the Nintendo um, Game Boy has four sound channels. It even has like stereo panning. You can have the channels in the middle, left or right. So it was actually pretty advanced for the time. Um, you can have um, two adjustable square wave channels. So you can adjust the pulse width to make it sound different. And then uh, you can have this uh, wavetable channel. So it's effectively a little sample that you play over and over again. And then you have the noise channel for, again, percussions. And uh, then. What we used there was this uh, little sound DJ that looks something like this. It actually has many different views. And uh, as you can probably already see here that this is not a tool that you can easily learn uh, within a day. There's a lot of like, uh, stuff you need to know about the Game Boy, uh, a lot of like mystical codes and numbers here and there. So this, uh, this turned out to be a bit tricky, but some of the students did manage this. Uh, some of them, well, at least they got some beeps out of it. But uh, yeah, the PGSCPIT, this is, this is a, an expert tool, not, not for necessarily everybody. And uh, yeah, this runs on real hardware. If you have a Game Boy, then you can use this there. And then we used emulators for running it on, on modern day computers. And now let's hear a tune. Um, I'll open Milky Tracker. And uh, we will hear um, a remix, tracker remix of Wolfpack's Conscious Club by Ol made by Olli Ketonen. And he did it uh, all in one afternoon using Milky Tracker. And you can also see how trackers work in general. So here's Milky Tracker, and I have the song open here. You can see here the tracks. And when the tune starts playing, then here you will also see like how each each channel looks like, how the waveforms are. So there's a kick and bass and snare like instruments that that, that Oli has used here. 
So let's try to synchronize now. I can't get sound output from my laptop, so it's the studio guys there who are going to play the music. So we are... Ah, oh, they started it already. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, well. Okay, this is how you do music with trackers. So you have here a note, you have here uh, the number of the instrument, so this would be the bass, and then here on the right of each channel you have the effect. Effects are like uh, volume or slide volume up down, slide pitch up and down, these sort of um, commands that you can give to alter the music and make it, make it more lively. And uh, if you are a child of the late 80s or early 90s and had an Amiga computer, uh, then you've probably seen some of this. Okay, then 2021. A bit more technical topic. Um, of course, uh, to take the music like uh, course, you had to know something about music. Like if you if you didn't know anything, then would would have been really tricky for you. Here, you had to know the basic coding skills, at least our like basic coding course, uh, so that you could you could get anywhere with with this course, but not awfully deep or or complicated. Anyway, they are art students, not technology students, so uh, we need to set the standards accordingly. But yeah, classic demo effects, how to make them. And uh, we would use like modern day tools for this, cutting corners, making it easier. But I would also always ex explain uh, when I showed an effect, I would explain like how was this done on old school hardware? Like what, was, what were the properties of old school hardware that were exploited for making these sort of effects uh, back in the day? So that would again like build a bridge between the past and today. And uh, again, a little history blurb on Monday. Then we made a little fake crack intro, and I explained what crack intros are in the first place. Then uh, we did a little Commodore 64 text mode programming uh, experiment, and some more effects, some more effects. And then Tero Heikinen came to talk about ZX Spectrum graphics and how you would program for that. That, again, turned out to be a bit challenging for, for uh, newcomers because ZX Spectrum graphics are a bit complicated if you've ever looked into how, how to program that. Just to get a pixel on the screen isn't, <laughs> isn't easy. But um, at least I hope it illustrated that it wasn't an, an easy job to make a Spectrum game. Uh, again, Thursday was a public holiday, so we didn't have any teaching. And uh, Friday, some more effects. And also we looked into bitplane graphics, how they work. Did a little experiment with bitplane graphics. And then uh, also, what, what does it mean to have a, a selectable palette? Like, what sort of tricks can you do with, by changing the colors real time? So really, like 80s, 90s, uh, good old demo scene uh, tricks and tips. And on the left, it's me some years ago with Pete uh, doing some demo coding at their place. And. Uh, we used processing for this part of, of, of the course. So um, I would show, like we would together build, like little by little, an effect from scratch. 
and then uh, then they would have uh, the chance, like some time to modify it, make it more interesting. Uh, this is how it practically went. So we started from a clean sketch, as they are called these processing programs. Uh, we started from a clean sketch, typed it there, discussed like, okay, why do we do this? Why do we do that? And then when we got something running, then they could modify it to their heart's content and uh, try 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 making it more interesting. So yeah, processing already from 2001, this Java-based low-threshold programming environment. So if you just want to get a window open and some like uh, lines or rectangles there, processing is a very good choice. So you don't need this like kilometer-long uh, setup function to get a window open. So very like easy easy to access uh, tool in that respect. And what did we do? Here's uh, the fake crack intro we did. Color bars and all, ADM, Alive Dead Media, cracked uh, cookie clicker in 2021. And then, of course, we have a scrolling text here down at the bottom with greetings to our friends. Then in the middle, this was the Petsky experiment. I will show you how this worked. So, of course, this is not the real Commodore 64. Like, doing something for that in, in the course of, like, some morning or something wouldn't be possible. So I made this, like, little... Um, interface that made um, programming look like as if it was on the Commodore. Simplifying it a bit, but uh, so that they would get this like idea, okay, I put a number in this array here, and something appears on the screen in different color. When you get that feel, then um, they could actually grasp this pretty quick, even if, if uh, not all of them were very apt programmers. And then you would look at the character chart because it's fixed and you would find like interesting characters there to put on screen and try out the different 16 colors of the Commodore 64. Um, I expected this to be more difficult, but actually students got this and uh, got like quite interesting works done uh, pretty, pretty quickly with this. Then we did another classic uh, interference circles, uh, twister of course. At the end of the course, I realized I had I have made an old school demo here <laughs> over the course, but I, I didn't make it into a real one. Yeah, a, a twister, probably the second twister in my whole life. I've only met one before this. Uh, then we had to make a star field, of course, and the course concluded with a 3D tunnel. So really, and there were a few more that I, I don't have here, but anyway, really, really like classic cheesy <laughs> stuff we, we went through. With the purpose of, first of all, like experimenting, secondly, learning how this stuff could have been done back in the day, because these days it's super easy, just like plot anything there and it runs fine, but back in the day it wasn't that easy. It was, it was uh, the, the computing power and, and everything you had was much less, so you had to come up with tricks to do this stuff. And uh, then thirdly also, learning some math and, and uh, programming uh, skills along the way. How do you make things turn? How do you, uh, there's an array like here where, the, where you, if you made a twister, you have this like corkscrew in a picture. How do we like make it continuously rotate like this? Learning this sort of like basic, basic computer graphics along the way. And for say for the tunnel, you need to know like radial mapping and how do we get it like darker in the distance? These sort of like uh, useful stuff that you can, you can use elsewhere. And um, this, at this point, let's see, um, for example, this one is the, the interference. Like straight out of Bud Brain Mega Demo <laughs> on the Amiga. Now, I have to say, it's just circles. It's it's not like any bit planes. On the Amiga, we would have bit planes that we would, like, the circles were there already, and you would move the bit planes and their starting points. But uh, here, well, on the comfort of, of current day computing, we can do things a bit lazy. It's just some simple circles that are being drawn. No, <laughs> it looks the same, but I, 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 it's not very ingenious. I can draw circles, wow. <laughs> but nevertheless, we also looked into how, this, how, how you would have done this before. And the translucency, when you set the colors for the bit planes, you can have this sort of translucency for free. Um, I tried to tell them also about the 
uh, tips and tricks that they would employ back in the day. And then here's the Petski experiment. Ah, uh -huh, not that. Not that. Wrong window. This one. Ah, uh, no. This one. Okay, here's a uh, Commodore 64 screen, sort of, with the uh, Commodore 64 16 colors and uh, uh, the standard character set, which has these sticks in, within a s uh, one character position. You can have this stick, there's these characters for stick on the left gliding toward the right, and then when you animate that, you can make waves like this. And I'm here also animating the colors, so makes for some sort of like water lookalike effect there. And uh, here I could also show a bit how we did the coding. So I did here uh, this little interface, like I said, uh, called Petski Render. Uh, here you would have an array called Screen, where you put the character codes. Then you would have an array called Colors, where you put the color codes. And then you would call Petski Render. And then that would output you on the window there. Whatever you had there in the screen and color arrays, it would turn it into something that a Commodore 64 could display. So everything we see on the screen here, this could be shown on a real Commodore, but then it's another thing, of course, if the C64 could calculate this real time. But at least it's like every frame here is something that a Commodore could show. So it's, in that sense, it's quite real. And in some sense, it's completely fake. But yeah, uh, what surprised me here was how well the students grasped this. They could find interesting characters on the character set, and they would like easily whack them in this, uh, like we're doing here. They would get, try them out, put them in the screen array. They would change the colors. And actually, in very short time, they did some quite interesting works. So this seemed to be quite easy to approach compared to some of the other stuff we did over the course. And then the last year, which was this spring, and uh, now again the topic was pixel and text graphics or retro graphics. And what we would do is create uh, works for 80s home computers using modern tools. So you would draw on your PC or Mac or uh, whatever you had using a mouse and such, but then the output would always work on a real Spectrum, Commodore 64, Amstrad CPC. We also brought those computers there. C64, pretty easy. Spectrum, very easy. Amstrad CPC, a lot of all sorts of cables and converting and external uh, disk emulators. <laughs> but, and uh, several cables running between uh, places and, and transformers. But we also could get um, the Amstrad CPC to display some image and uh, run the student work. So the, we, can, we can made it real. So. You could see your drawings on a real 80s computer. Uh, yeah, Monday again, some history, but then we went for text art. This is something I've been doing plenty, Commodore 64, Petski text art. Uh, and the tool was also made by me. So we started with that. And then Tuesday, we had uh, Derek Holzer doing analog graphics. So this was uh, things like you know, like how oscilloscopes work, and if you see the Vectrex uh, uh, games console, it's like not pixel graphics at all, but vector graphics, like these sharp curves and, and, and uh, lines that you can make with vector graphics. And Derek is very much into this, and uh, he, he ran one day of this. So you could create sound, and that would be visualized using, uh, I think first year it was some modified Vectrex, and now it was probably some... some uh, I don't remember if it was a laser or if it was just just some oscilloscope, but nevertheless, like uh, something very real analog compared to a flat modern-day screen like yours. Then uh, Wednesday and Thursday were game mockups. First, a game uh, screen mockup for the ZX Spectrum. Here, Tero Heikinen came in and uh, helped help with this. And then Thursday was a game title screen mockup for Amstrad CPC. And Friday, we again had a screening of works. So let's see uh, 
what we did and what we used for this, this run of the course. Commodore 64, for some of you probably very familiar, some of you some alien old computer from 82. Nevertheless, the world's most popular home computer ever. And uh, here is the, we did, of course, Commodore 64 has all sorts of graphics modes, but we did this text graphics to so start off with that, kind of the roots. Before you had pixel graphics, you would go with text graphics. So now we sort of move from there, like uh, from simpler text graphics to more advanced pixel graphics. And here's the character set of Commodore 64, the default set that you use. 256 different symbols that you can use, and then you make art with these. And the uh, Commodore 64 can display 40 by 25 characters. So that's a thousand character locations where you can place any of these uh, symbols. And you notice halfway through, it's inverted versions of the above. So it's actually just 127, uh, 128 uh, glyphs that are then inverted in the second half. But um, yeah, of course there's numbers and letters, but then there's also these like graphical characters like sticks, corners, turns, and these will let you make something more graphical than just, just text. And then at times the inverted versions are really useful. Say this triangle here, the inverted triangle points in the other direction. So uh, this way you can make all sorts of geometrical shapes and even some pseudo 3D as we will see. And here's the Commodore 64 palette, 16 colors. And uh, something to note here, when we look into those two other computers we, we made graphics for, how the Commodore 64 palette is sort of designed. It's not just red, no red, blue, no blue, but somebody actually put some thought into the Commodore 64 palette. So you can see that all the colors are a bit muted. There's not like bright blue, bright red. Uh, all the colors pretty much are some sort of like combinations of red, green, and blue. So it looks like um, earthly and muted compared to most of the 80s uh, home computers. So it was actually designed, not, not just like let's have electricity or no electricity. So it's not a very technical palette, but more like even like a thought out palette, you could say. And the tool we used, made by me, I'm here very modestly claiming that it's a pretty good tool, but it is. Uh, already 2013, started as a little project. I needed an editor like this. I couldn't find an editor like this, so I made one for myself. And uh, then people noticed it and started asking, could we have this and this and this and this and this and this? And um, after some years, uh, it turned into a very useful tool and has been used by people from at least all over Europe. Um, tens of people have done hundreds of works with this editor. So I guess it's good for something. I can show you quickly how it works. This is done in processing as well. So. When we start it up, here you can choose the platform. It supports more than just Commodore 64. There's these like pet computers, uh, Commodore Plus 4, even Vic 20. But uh, mostly Commodore 64 is, is used, I think. So here you have the character set. If you remember how it was here, you notice that this is a mess. Like. Where's the lines? Where can I find the next line? You cannot. It's, it's a mess. If you see it on a Commodore 64 keyboard, then you can find everything very nicely and conveniently there. But if it's just laid out like this, you cannot really find, OK, what's the next line? If you ever have the next line like to the right, a bit to the right, a bit to the right, you cannot really find them here easily. But uh, if you type this stuff, you can barely see here um, on the sides of the keys you have the characters. So you could do this sort of graphics already on the Commodore 64 by typing them on the keyboard. And there you have like, say for example, there's this circle consisting of four characters. They are there like at neighboring uh, keys. So you can make the circle pretty easily on a keyboard. Whereas if you try to find the circle parts here, OK, there's one, there's one, there's another, and, and then uh, there's one more. It's a mess. So. One of the first things 
we did. Tero Hekinen was helping me with the uh, ideation here when we were uh, doing our first pet ski art. He's a much more prominent pet ski artist than I will ever be. Uh, he's done really impressive works with the tool. Um, one of the first things we did is reorganize the characters. It doesn't need to be in the default order. There's like no reason for that. The artist is not interested in that, but they are interested in, hey, that circle, that's one. There's another. Hey, I could find the third one too. And now with uh, uh, some effort, oh, there's the fourth. I could make a circle. So we try to make those characters that you use together like easily discoverable. Like, for example, these lines here that go from top down or uh, left to right, they are there next to each other. The little thing uh, that made this much more useful to the artist. So they don't need to always find and find where was that character that I needed. And a lot more here. Uh, you can use the different uh, colors. There's a lot of functionality here if you know your keyboard. You can juggle with that. You can make selections like this draw with the selections. This is partially inspired by Deluxe Paint, the classic 80s, early 90s paint program. You can do magic things with uh, selection, like recoloring, for example. All sorts of things. You can rotate the selection. You can flip the selection, and so on and so on. A lot of things we don't really have time to cover here. But uh, yeah, this is what I gave to the students uh, with a little tutorial, of course and then the a link to the keyboard magic comments that there are plenty. And uh, let's see what we got out of that. Here are nine pet ski graphics that students did in one afternoon. So we had, I think, eight students. So one, one person made two, but yep, one per each here in a, in a sense. And it's low resolution, 16 colors, fixed characters. But still, if you look at it, there's many styles there already. So even if it's so rudimentary and simple, here we have like a cartoony like line style. Here, this is more like graffiti. This is like, again, like different cartoony. Here's more like ge geometrical. Here's even some pseudo 3D. So even with these limited means, students could make quite you, you can tell that there's different styles there. So um, one thing that clearly stood out throughout the whole course is that um, when you're, the students uh, we have are often already pretty good at, say, drawing or composing or such, and they might have their personal artistic style, they can kind of import it from the outside world and do something like this using these limited means. Okay, moving on to single ZX Spectrum, also an 82 computer, a British computer. A nice lo little box like this. And uh, here the purpose was pixel graphics, not uh, text graphics anymore. You can see here the colors that the Spectrum has. It effectively has uh, eight colors, on and off uh, red, green, blue, and then there's a brightness. So that makes it 15 colors, because black is the same brightness. Like you, cannot, you don't have this like light black or anything. So 15 different colors. And uh, the limit for the ZX Spectrum is that for a position of 8 by 8 pixels, within that area, you can have two colors. So if you want to have three colors there, then that's a no-no. So you need to plan ahead. You cannot just like go there freely drawing what you wanted, because then you know that you will be busting the old colors, and oh, no, I cannot have this color here. I need to limit it to two. So this is really a trade when you get to it. Uh, people have been honing their skills for years and years, and now they make really impressive spectrum graphics, and they can hide the color re restrictions and so on. Well, we cannot expect that the students who just got this tool would do that in an afternoon. But um, here uh, we used another tool. This is MultiPaint by Tero Heikkinen, supporting other platforms than just uh, ZX Spectrum. Also, Commodore 64 graphics modes. There's uh, Amstrad CPC modes. I think uh, Atari ST these days. So you can, with this tool, you can draw for uh, several retro computers. And again, this keeps it real. Whatever you have on the screen here, you can show on a real, here's a C64 image. So if you, if you have this, then uh, 
shown on the screen, you can be sure that you can export it, run it on a real 64. So this is not like something that looks like it, but this is the real deal. So this is an image that you could display on a real machine. So it, it, it always like sticks to the real limits of, of, the, of the actual machine. And this very much looks like Deluxe Paint if you've ever used that, or maybe Graphics 2 if you've used that. Here you have various like uh, flood fields and spray cans and, and uh, the kind of like tricks, tools of the trade. And here's the results from the Wednesday when they made for the ZX Spectrum a game mock-up. So this was supposed to be a game screen running on the ZX Spectrum. And some of them actually do really much look like ZX Spectrum games. For example, this one here, I could imagine that this would run on a real Spectrum. There was like little animations, probably you would avoid the enemies. Then some of this stuff may be a bit hopeful for the Spectrum. You could display the image, but for example, this sort of shoot them up with the ZX Spectrum capabilities with these big spa spaceships moving there. <laughs> well, good luck. <laughs> it's, it's, it would be um, really uh, an achievement to make this work on a Spectrum. Um, but yeah, this one, this one, uh, maybe this one, I, I could see work on a real machine. Uh, this one too. So there's also like different kind of game genres here. There's all sorts of action. This one, uh, this sloth here, there would be like food falling and the sloth would pick them and eat them. Uh, pretty li nice looking sloth rendition there in, in spectrum colors and, and, uh, and the palette. And here's some like ninja action, I think. And another space shooter. And the third machine, so we covered as many as three throughout the week. Uh, the third machine was Amstrad CPC from 84 one of the kind of later 8-bit computers already. And uh, it has various graphics modes. Uh, we used this low res of 160 by 200 pixels. If you think of it, it's not square pixels at all. The pixels are pretty wide. They are about twice as wide as high. So you would draw with these horizontal sticks rather than square pixels. Uh, then. The Amstrad CPC is a bit more advanced color-wise. It has you can have 16 colors on the screen, but you can choose them out of a larger palette. This is the 27 colors that the Amstrad CPC has. So you can have 16 colors on screen, but you can each of the colors you can choose from this uh, larger set of 27. Again, this is pretty technical palette, as you can see. It's not like very well um, designed. CPC graphics tend to look very colorful, like circus-like, because of this. This is just, again, like uh, some red electricity, a bit more red electricity, a bit blue electricity. This sort of almost on and off, like we had with Spectrum here. Same sort of idea, more or less electricity, not like what would be a good color for making something. Not a not, not very designed palette. But let's see what the students did. And now, the big difference here compared to Spectrum, you can have free pixel placement. So now, finally, you can choose the color for each pixel. So you don't need to care about those restrictions, uh, how many colors you can have in a block of any size. So you can so here, here do pretty, pretty free-form pixel graphics. And they did. And this was supposed to be the title screen for the game they did on Wednesday. So this is the kind of... Amstrad version of the game and the title screen, the, the attract screen, and then the game would, would start after this. So we had this, for example, this was the shooting game, and this was another shooting game, Slime Fight. What was Slime Fight? Is it this? Uh, I don't even know. And uh, even this sort of Star Wars rendition. <coughs> and uh, Sloth was already nice here, and then, well, you can probably tell here, this is not the first time this person is drawing, Aurora is drawing like any, <laughs> any pixel graphics, so it already has this like nice character, and, uh, and um, there's even some little dithering there, because 16 colors is still not a lot, so you would use like neighboring colors to make these shades, and, and um, that's a big trade of its own. Yes. We are almost done. So just quickly, some 
final words and reflection. What did we learn? Four runs of the course, four years. Um, well, how, how did it go? First of all, the course found its audience. First, it was the first run, I think we had only four students. Toward the end, it was always more or less 10. So it found the audience, people who are interested in the subject knew that there was a course like this. And uh, some, of, some of them would come like already like a second time when they'd taken one theme, then they would come next year for another theme. And uh, you could see that they put a lot of effort into those works, even though at times the tools were alien, uh, clumsy, and uh, like graphics modes and such difficult for them at the beginning, then uh, you could still, like, some of them kept going with the images, like, improved them in their free time after class and, and tried to make them, like, look good for the final presentation. And uh, definitely a lot of experimentation and effort from the student side. Uh, so one takeaway from this would be reserve time. If you're ever going to do something like this, then reserve time for that experimentation. It takes time and it also is motivating instead of just like listening and listening and repeating what you do there. So give time for that. We had lively discussions on various subjects, hardware, software, games. Also a bit more like a wider scope, say the history of computing. And uh, at times, for example, British games, why were they so special? Like, what was so weird about British games? These sort of topics popped up. Like, there was this, like, social commentary uh, on British games that you can't really find on, uh, on other games uh, of the time. So why was that? Why is there Manic Miner? Okay, Miner, Britain used to be, like, a big mining country and so on and so on. So these sort of further, further um, topics and, and discussions popped up uh, over over the course. And uh, a lot of things came together here. There was art, of course, you did creative works. There was history. There's a history to these machines, history to these games. Then there was plenty of uh, hardware. Why is it that things look this way? And then software. Like, why do those old computer graphic uh, titles and such, why do they look so trashy very often? Well, you probably would draw them on a joystick instead of a modern computer and a mouse. So there were these like, reasons for, for things as well. So it's not, the hardware is still the same. It's been that for like three decades at least. But then the tools have improved vastly over that time. So now on today's computers, it's much easier to create content for retro computers. Uh, so um, in the academic field, there's uh, these traits of, of media archaeology and platform studies. They are very much in, in these same lines. And uh, then one thing, not a necessarily a bad thing, but a tricky thing was that uh, if you're going to have a separate different topic for each year, that's a lot of work. OK, let's find again like people who could teach this. Let's again make more slides. Let's again like. Uh, find readings for this. Let's again like prepare exercises. So uh, yeah, this, this was at times heavy. Rewarding, I liked it and all, but uh, if you need to change the subject every year, then at some point you probably run out of relevant topics and need to, need to go back to the old ones. But all in all, I would say the course was a success and I was happy to give it. And also it seems the students liked it and, and, and put, put their heart into it. So this was one of the best courses I've taught. I, I have to say. But a live dead media is dead. Uh, this is what happened with all sorts of organizational changes. And uh, the course is no more, unfortunately. But um, maybe it's alive after all. So now with the given current new course schedule. We cannot have this course, but we could maybe have something like it. Maybe the theme would live on, this sort of retro computing, dead media, media archaeology. So I'm trying to um, come up with another course that we can have in the current framework of, 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 of the curriculum. And, and uh, maybe it will be more like a research course where we look into retro topics. But I still think there's a place and a time for this sort of teaching even in the field of new media, which is often so much about new things and flashy things and the latest things. But I still want to keep that historical perspective and, and uh, understanding there. 
So I'm hoping that maybe next spring there will again be something like this, not a live dead media and not quite like this, but something that uh, would still give the students the possibility to learn about the past and, and uh, bridge the gap between dead media and new media. That's it. Thank you for your uh, interest. And uh, now I guess if somebody want to ask something, we could afford it or Sonia kicks me out of here. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I need to kick you out. <laughs> okay. We need to do a bit of uh, change of chairs and <laughs> prepare for the next speaker. But Marco, thanks so much. Okay. Hey, thanks. <laughs>